In this section, we'll discuss damp harmonic oscillations. For damped harmonic oscillations, we include now not just the force due to the spring constant. This is the Hooke's Law uh, component uh, of the acceleration. But now we also include a damping term here. And so the little hieroglyphic we often have to uh, represent a, a damped harmonic oscillator is shown down here. Here's our spring. Here's our mass. And then often we draw something called a dash pot. So this is, you want to have in your mind the idea that it's just kind of a pot of some sort of viscous goo, and there's a piston here attached to the mass. And so as the mass oscillates back and forth, this piston drags in the goo, and that basically represents uh, the damping term. So here, this is the Hooke's Law term. This is the spring. Here's the damping term. And so our accelerations, uh, the sum of forces on our, on our oscillating mass are the damping plus the, uh, the spring term. Now, in reality, all uh, oscillating systems have some amount of damping. And so, really, uh, when you learned about oscillators back in uh, your first physics courses, you should have included a term like this uh, originally. But um, it's usually a very good approximation to just ignore any damping or energy loss. Uh, but here, in this section, we're going to actually address that and look at what happens to the oscillations uh, when you actually include damping. It's also important to note that uh, the damping here we've assumed is proportional to the velocity. It doesn't have to be. Uh, you may recall from uh, chapter two that this is a uh, this represents a, a linear um, drag term. Uh, you could have a quadratic drag. Uh, you could have more complicated drag terms. Uh, but for simplicity, to introduce the basic idea of damping in an oscillator, we're going to think about a linear drag term and show how you solve this differential equation. Uh, for a variety of different kinds of damped oscillators. And I'm not going to walk through it uh, in detail, the solution for, for the uh, damped harmonic oscillator case. Uh, the book actually does a very good job of walking through the solutions. I'm just going to touch on the high highlights. First thing you do is to recast that um, mx double dot equation into a, a differential equation that looks like this. Basically, you've divided through by masses, um, uh, taken all the uh, all the damping and the, the spring force terms to the left hand side of the equation. And so now what we have is a second order um, differential equation uh, with a term linear in x dot and a term linear in x. And so what we're looking for is a solution for x as a function of time. So the um, displacement from an equilibrium as a function of time. Hopefully you recall from your DVQ class that if you have a second order differential equation you need at least two linearly independent uh, solutions in order to construct any solution. So we need two linearly independent solutions. Um, as the book describes, uh, we assume a solution uh, of a particularly simple form, just e to the rt, with the uh, understanding that this r here can actually be uh, imaginary. And as we'll see, um, depending on the relative values of, of beta, and omega naught, um, R will have a, a real component and an imaginary component. And if we take beta to be equal to zero, then that will be a, a harmonic oscillator without any damping. And in that case, we just get x double dot plus omega naught squared x equals zero. That would just be our standard uh, harmonic oscillator equation. And in that case, you know that the solution uh, would just be a combination of sines and cosines or a combination of uh, e to the i omega naught times t, um, and then we need to solve for the constants. So let's look at cases where uh, beta is non-zero. So we start first uh, with weak damping. So this is the idea that the damping term uh, in the differential equation is small compared to the spring force term. So you can imagine, for instance, that this condition holds. Uh, this condition doesn't necessarily have to hold, but what's imp the important condition is that this is ho holds, that beta is smaller than omega naught. Uh, in that case, you get a solution that looks like this. Uh, x of t is going to be some amplitude a times e to the minus beta t times cosine omega 1 t minus delta. So a few things to note as compared to the uh, undamped harmonic oscillator. So in the undamped harmonic oscillator case, we don't have this term. So this term isn't in there. There's no damping in the un uh, undamped harmonic oscillator. Um, also, this frequency of oscillation for the damped term um, excuse me, for the damped, weakly damped oscillator, this frequency is less than 
the natural frequency of the system omega naught. And that's because, of course, you have some damping, so that's modified the oscillatory frequency. But the basic structure of this solution is pretty simple to interpret. Um, we've got A times cosine, and so that's going to be an oscillator. And on top of that, we have this damping term. And so what happens, basically, is you have a harmonic oscillator uh, whose amplitude is constantly getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you get some basic oscillations, you get some, some distinctive oscillations, but the amplitudes of those oscillations are getting smaller with time, and that's because of this term here. So in the case of weak damping, it's pretty simple. It, it resembles, uh, it's an oscillator that resembles in many ways the undamped case. It's just uh, got an amplitude that's decaying with time exponentially. The next case that the book considers is what's called strong damping. So now we have a damping term which is actually bigger than the harmonic oscillator term, than the uh, spring force term. And so we, in this case, um, there's a lot of damping, and the oscillator doesn't even, uh, excuse me, the, the spring doesn't even get to complete one full oscillation before this damping actually damps out the motion. It's a solution for a strongly damped oscillator. Uh, it looks like this. It's the sum of two exponential terms e to the minus something t, e to the minus something t. So what's important to note here is that uh, each of these terms here being multiplied by t uh, is negative. So there's a minus sign here, and everything inside of the square bracket, this, the, excuse me, the parentheses is going to be a positive number. Same with this. And so this is actually just two exponentially damping uh, expressions. And so we expect that the amplitude of oscillation it's just going to damp. There's not going to be any oscillatory motion. You can see there's no sines and cosines in here. And as shown by the book on page 177, um, depending on the initial conditions, the initial velocity and, and displacement, you can get a solution that looks like this. So you can get, um, it, maybe if you have an initial uh, non-zero velocity, you can get uh, the oscillator uh, jumping up in displacement and then just slowly damping out with time as a result of these two exponential uh, decaying functions. So there's not even really an oscillation uh, for the case of strong damping. The, the damping term actually dominates over the oscillatory component and you get no oscillations at all. And then finally we have the case where uh, we have critical damping. And in this case the damping parameter beta is exactly equal to uh, the natural frequency of the oscillator. And so here we have damping that just manages to balance out, uh, we, that can just be, manage to balance out the spring force term. Uh, in this case, as the book describes, when you go to calculate the roots uh, for your solution, your assumed solution, e to the rt, you find that both of the roots end up being exactly the same. They both end up being uh, exactly the same number, uh, beta. And so, remember, we require, because we have a second-order differential equation, two linearly independent solutions, two linearly independent solutions. And so, um, in order to make a linearly independent solution, um, in order to make two of them, we have to basically modify our assumed uh, solution. And so you get a solution, in the case of critical damping, with the following form. x of t is going to be some constant c1 plus c2 times t, all times the exponential damping term. So in this case, we also don't quite get oscillations, um, but we can get a solution that exhibits some other interesting behavior. So if we tried to make a graph of this, it depends on exactly what the initial conditions are, but we can imagine an oscillator where we start out with some non-zero uh, displacement, and depending on the relative values of C1, C2, you can have a solution that damps out and then hits zero. Um, and you might ask the question, what's, what's important? Why would we be, even be interested in a system with critical damping? Um, critical damping is actually really important for uh, control systems. Uh, so for instance, if you imagine uh, the joystick, or excuse me, the, 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 uh, the stick on a plane that you use to fly the plane, um, there's some amount of damping in that stick that allows the pilot uh, to more carefully, to more accurately pilot the, the, the plane. So for instance, if that joystick exhibited uh, weak damping, then when the pilot displaced the stick to uh, away from equilibrium and let it go, the stick would actually bounce back and forth many, many times. And you can imagine that would be really dangerous for the plane as the plane swung around uh, as a result of this bouncing. On the other hand, 
if you had strong damping in the joystick for a plane, that would make it hard to steer the plane because the pilot would constantly be working against the damping in the joystick to push the plane around. And so in that case, what you'd like is uh, a, a critical damping. You want just enough damping to keep the, the stick from bouncing around, but not so much that it's hard for the pilot to steer the plane. And so actually a lot of engineered systems uh, involve critical damping um, in order to damp out oscillations, but also not make it too hard to control the system. So critical damping actually is, is, is really important, uh, has a really important place in control systems and, con and uh, engineering. And so just to convince you uh, that this solution for the critically damped case uh, is actually uh, a solution for the differential equation, the original differential equation, um, I'm going to plug this solution in to the differential equation and show that it satisfies it. Um, uh, what's important here to remember now is we have two linearly independent solutions, c1 e to the minus beta t, and then c2 t e to the minus beta t. And I'm not going to get into the details of what makes a, a solution linearly, or what makes the solutions linearly, linearly independent. Uh, you can think of them as just being functions that are sufficiently different that they um, that you can construct any solution to the differential equation out of those two solutions. So they're like a little bit like like Legos that have different shapes in that in that idea. So you can construct any general solution for this differential equation using the combination of these two solutions. And so what I'm going to do is plug each of the solutions in one at a time to this differential equation and show that they both individually satisfy the differential equation. So let's start with the C1 solution. So we'll say uh, x of t is just C1 e to the minus beta t. Now remember that for the critical damping case, beta is equal to omega naught. And so this differential equation is going to become x double dot plus 2 beta x plus beta x, excuse me, 2 beta x dot plus beta x, and that's all equal to 0. We'll take two time derivatives uh, in order to get this first term, and that gives me what? It's going to give me c1 times, uh, with a minus sign up front, beta squared uh, e to the minus beta t, oops, let's try to get that written, minus beta t, Uh, plus 2 times beta x dot, and, and one, one time derivative is going to give me c1, and then one factor of beta is going to come down from the exponent, but of course we have another beta already there, and so we're going to get beta squared e to the minus beta t, and excuse me, we have a 2 up front, remember, this is a 2 here, so we got to make sure that 2 ends up in our final solution, and then the last term plus Excuse me, this is supposed to be a beta squared, remember, because the last term here is supposed to be omega naught squared. And so just to expand a little more on uh, the solution for the critically damped case, I'm going to take uh, this solution that we have here uh, and plug it into our original differential equation and show that it does actually satisfy the original differential equation. Uh, remember that because we have a second order differential equation here, our final solution needs to consist of two linearly independent functions. We need those two linearly independent functions in order to in order to write the general solution. Now I'm not going to belabor what it means for a function uh, for functions to be linearly independent. Suffice it to say it means that the two functions are sufficiently different that when you uh, combine them they give they can basically give you any function that you need. So you can imagine these two solutions c1 e to the minus beta t and c2 t e to the minus beta t uh, you can imagine those two solutions as being sort of differently shaped Legos, and you can build any solution you like, x of t, by combining those two Legos together. Okay, so let's start by uh, plugging uh, this solution into our differential equation, which is written there. So we take two time derivatives. Uh, that's going to give me c1 with a minus sign, excuse me, with a plus sign, c1 beta squared e to the minus beta t, okay, that's just two time, time derivatives, plus um, two times beta times one time derivative 
So that's going to give you minus C1 beta e to the minus beta t. And then finally, plus omega naught squared. But remember, this is the critically damped case. And so omega is exactly equal to beta by assumption. And so that last term is just going to turn out to be um, beta squared c1 e to the minus beta t. And hopefully you can see that uh, when I add these three terms together, I get uh, exactly 0. So that shows us that at least the first solution here uh, satisfies the differential equation. So let's check the second solution to see if that satisfies the differential equation. We'll start a fresh page here, give us more space. Okay, so again, here's our second uh, term in our solution. Here's our original differential equation. Let's take some time derivatives here. We'll start out by just looking at the time derivatives because these can be a little messy. So we need to apply two time derivatives to this expression. Okay, so we'll apply, apply the first time derivative. That's going to give us what? C2 e to the minus beta t minus uh, c2 t beta e to the minus beta t. Okay, remember you were doing a, uh, a product rule here in order to take this derivative. Then we'll apply that second time derivative. We're going to get what? Uh, minus c2 beta e to the minus beta t um, blah, 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 minus c2 beta e to the minus beta t and then the last term is going to give us a plus sign c2 t beta squared e to the minus beta t okay so we got all of this for x double dot. And hopefully you can see that these first two terms are the same, and so we're just going to get 2 times c2 beta e to the minus beta t. Okay, so plugging that back into our differential equation, here's our original differential equation, and again, remember, omega naught equals beta, that's our critical damping. Okay, so our x double dot, we get um, minus 2 c2 beta e to the minus beta t plus c2 t beta squared e to the minus beta t. Then for our linear term, we get plus 2 beta c2 e to the minus beta t minus c2 t beta e to the minus beta t. And then finally, our last term, we get beta squared c2 t e to the minus beta t. And what we find is uh, this term here, we'll cancel that term, and this term here, we'll cancel one of those guys, and then this one too, because remember there's a 2 up front here. So the whole thing is going to work out to be equal to 0. And so these, both these solutions, the C1 and C2 uh, solutions, satisfy the differential equation in the end.